tolerance and difference, difference and tolerance. Um, for me, doing what I do and being what I am, um, difference and tolerance are a matter of culture and usually defined in cultural terms. Culture, in a nutshell, is the expression of how we perceive the world, how we interpret our environment and assess the people we meet. Our interpretation of what we perceive is guided by affections, by convictions, preconceived notions, beliefs, values. In other words, culture is about positioning yourself within your environment and your community. It is also about distancing or separating yourself from individuals or communities. When culture aids us in positioning ourselves within our environments or communities, it provides orientation and creates identities. In principle, just as cultures, and we've heard this a lot today, identities are not a very stable thing. We all know this. They're a constant and dynamic process of mediation between the affections, the preconceived notions, the convictions, the beliefs and values that I've talked about. Today, I'm certainly not the person I was five days ago, and I cannot even remember what and who I was five months ago. One could argue that material culture and cultural materials are so attractive to us and powerful because they are potentially more stable than human identities and social communities. Buildings and monuments may last for hundreds, if not for thousands of years, and some valuable family heirloom may be passed down from generation to generation, a ring, a watch, a painting, or a handwritten letter. Granted, cultural objects do not possess a meaning by themselves. Ultimately, they are what we make of them, what we see in them. But still, cultural objects, be, the, be they immovable or movable, somehow give us a sense of stability, of duration, of lasting value, something that many human beings seem to be longing for, especially in times of pronounced instability. In addition, cultural objects often are an expression of achievement, of prosperity, success, but sometimes, on the other hand, there are also beacons of conflict and war, natural disasters, or humanitarian crisis. But they have one thing in common. They always, always invariably point to the past and they evoke history. Cultural objects are the material anchors for our narratives about the past. Cultural objects aid us in the creation of lasting identities. They frame historical narratives. They are material witnesses to past greatness or failure. They may even be seen as embodying values and beliefs. And now this is important. When cultural objects are considered by communities to represent something special, something related to the chosen identity of that community, they become heritage, cultural heritage. Let us be very clear, as much as cultural heritage is an expression of identity for any community, it is also a material expression of difference for anybody who does not belong to that community. In that case, cultural heritage and culture as a whole may be perceived as a symbol of the other, or even as a threat to one's own identity. It is through culture, and in particular through cultural heritage, that differences become palpable, and that differences may be emphasized and reinforced or mitigated, mediated, or overcome, as the case may be. This is the reason why throughout history, cultural heritage has been a target during wars and periods of power asymmetries, such as imperial or colonial domination. On the other hand, culture is a powerful instrument for rehabilitation 
in post-conflict societies. When you destroy or displace the culture of a community, you erase its history, you negate its achievements, you take away its common point of reference, its orientation. By destroying or displacing cultural heritage of a community, you also reduce its chances for sustainable development, for cultural diversity, for post-conflict rehabilitation and reconciliation. And one of these sad examples is the destruction, the blowing up of the so-called Northwest Palace at the site of Nimrud in Iraq. And when you look at the pictures, you realize that there is not much left of the palace. And this is doubly sad, not only in the sense that this is an amazing witness to um, achievements of the Assyrian, the Mesopotamian culture, but this was also a site that was relatively well accessible in terms of uh, touristic use. So the community, the local communities, as well as the state of Iraq, has suffered in more than one sense. There are many examples for the destruction of cultural heritage in a context of war or crisis. You can go back all the way to the ancient Near East in the second millennium, BCE, the Elamites invaded Mesopotamia, they invaded Babylonia and took material hostages. They took away the famous stele of Hammurabi that some of you may know that's now in the Louvre. It was found in today Iran because it was deported in antiquity. Or think about the Romans or in Berlin, of course, we should be thinking about this guy who took away our quadriga and celebrated this as a big event. And when it returned some years later, there was another big celebration here in Berlin. There is also something else that's very important, that is the displacement of cultural heritage as a result of power asymmetries. Power asymmetries that express themselves in colonial or imperial domination for purposes of research or for the creation of so-called universal collections or universal museums. But bear in mind, both destruction and displacement equally are equally harmful for the affected society. And when you think about the dimension this may have, think about the destruction of the Baal Shamin temple in Palmyra. Yes, for an archaeologist, this is horrible, but it was also a great loss for the local community because they would hold their weddings there. And the first thing they said when they were asked, why are you sad that this is destroyed? They said, because this is a place for identity for us. This is where we used to hold our weddings. This is where we used to go to celebrate. As we are aware of the social, political, and economic power of culture and cultural heritage, we should do all we can to protect, promote, and share cultural heritage. It is by protecting and sharing culture that we enable orientation and identification. I think culture is a synonym for diversity. When we promote culture, we foster tolerance, the ability to accept the own and the ability to embrace the other. Culture is an instrument for rehabilitation and reconciliation. Caring for their cultural heritage enables communities to overcome differences and strengthen social cohesion. And there are many, many examples for this all over the world. Now, the big question for us, and this is why probably this talk belongs in this conference, is the big question is, what does that mean for us? How do we go about culture? How are we dealing with cultural heritage? And that, of course, depends on the individual degree of responsibility. When I look at my own work at the Pergamon Museum here in Berlin, for me, it's very important, first of all, to establish accountability and transparency as to the history of the collections that I'm in charge of. But we're also using our expertise in the um, area of the archaeological cultural heritage of Iraq and Syria to contribute to its protection. We do capacity building projects. We do research on illicit trafficking. We help develop standards for 3D digitization of cultural heritage. And we do a lot of awareness raising, like today. But there is also the level of the local communities. They play a vital role in the preservation and development of cultural heritage. Local communities are the backbone of cultural heritage protection. Ultimately, they decide what to protect 
and how to protect it. This is very important. Nobody else can make that decision. It is the local communities who will have to care for the cultural property, the heritage, so they have to be able to make that decision um, autonomously. That also means that we have a responsibility and that it is necessary to empower the local communities to be better equipped to work with their cultural heritage, and that is usually done through awareness raising, capacity building, training, and last not least, funding. The national level, it was mentioned in the introduction, states need to provide adequate legal frameworks for the protection of cultural heritage, for example, laws that counter illicit trafficking in cultural goods. But they also need to think about how to create the expertise. They need to establish university programs or training programs in the area of pr the protection and management of cultural heritage and culture as a whole. And then there is the international community. The international community that we hear so much about, especially in these days when we talk about UNESCO and the countries that don't feel comfortable being part of UNESCO anymore. The international community has the obligation to provide aid to those who do not possess the means to protect or care for their cultural heritage. And this is particularly true in situations of conflict or disaster. And one great new innovative example of a of an international public-private partnership is Aleph. Aleph, a French Emirati initiative that was launched in March in Paris that has collected about $80 million um, and that is about to spend the money on long-term, mid-term projects for the protection of cultural heritage. Especially at a time when pluralism, free speech, democracy, human rights, and equal development opportunities are threatened around the world, we need culture and cultural heritage more than ever before. Culture and cultural heritage are not just an expression, they are not just symptoms of strong, resilient societies. Culture and cultural heritage are the key to strong and resilient societies. Thank you very much.